full. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of RSS podcast. This is the only feed you need. And today we have a very special guest live from Philly, Bearcat. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for jumping on and um, connecting. And yeah, I thought it'd be good to um, kind of like hear from your side and talk about your kind of musical journey and yeah, from formative years right through until, until modern day. So, I mean, before before we kind of dive into that, though, if you want to just um, kind of like introduce yourself to, to the audience. Yeah, oh God, I always, always hate doing this. Um, I'm Bearcat. Hello. As you can hear, I'm from London originally, but I've been in the States for the last six, six to five years, roughly. Um I was a full-time DJ (laughs) before COVID and a music producer and I curate uh, events and parties exclusively aimed towards um, LGBTQ youth that are, um, you know, we're centering like black and brown kids basically and, um, you know, not just young kids but just anyone on that spectrum that is black and brown. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, I guess. And yeah, I put music out, I'm just a music artist person, I guess. <laughs> I find it hard to, to do that description of myself. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think it's like, I feel like obviously like the, the kind of the influence from like, and crossover between like, especially from like music and like fashion, I think is um, a place where your kind of work seems to sit and obviously having worked with fashion brands and stuff like that with creating um, or curating um, the sort of score for their runway shows or campaigns. I think um, I know some, that's something of interest to kind of me, I guess, because that's what I try and do with the label. And I don't I think it's, it's kind of interesting when you're kind of pulling from, uh, from different areas and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, I mean, before we kind of get into that bit, though, can we kind of start with the formative years, I guess, um, potentially growing up in London and, and your kind of uh, earliest kind of like links and relationship to, to music? Music. Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a council estate in Brixton Hill with my grandparents. And um, one of my earliest memories, uh, I mean, my first memory of music would be, you know, my granddad was a bingo caller (laughs) and who liked to drink a lot. So he would come home, you know, um, super late at night, anywhere between like 12, 2 a.m. And a couple of times a week, he would like come home a little bit drunk and he would whack on like opera music, you know. And me as a kid, I would wake up and just like get out of bed and start doing like interpreting like ballet dances and stuff like that and so that was a really like you know that that, those are my first memories of really like feeling music and like jumping around and dancing and um and then you know you know I kind of I was raised with my like white Irish family but living in Brixton you know the second you step outside of the your doorstep you're hearing Jamaican music, you're hearing all kinds of different styles of music. It's a melting pot, you know, London is such a melting pot of different cultures. And um, yeah, especially a place like Brixton, you know, there's just all kinds of influences and sounds. And I specifically remember like my neighbors who were part of like the Baptist church, they would play a lot of like um, soul and R&B and stuff like that. Also my family would play like reggae too. Like I feel like we lived in this uh, block and everyone was super musical and would play music. And so, yeah, it was started with, I think my first memory is like, having a key key with my granddad in the middle of the night to opera music to then kind of, you know, um, noticing different styles from neighbors and stuff like that. And then it's when I went to school that I was really exposed to like all different kinds of things. But I think I'm just remembering a memory actually, you know, I used to spend a lot of time by myself as a kid. So like after school I would come home and literally just put the box on. you know and just sit there in front of the box and like watch these music videos you know and I feel like that really 
planted the seed because seeing the visual element go along with the sound just had a really, really crazy impact on me. And even now I know it's like my goals and aspirations really lie heavily with a visual element, which is something that I haven't really presented to the world yet, but it's something that I'm conjuring. And um, yeah, I just kind of put that together actually. I think like me sitting in front of uh, music videos for like four hours <laughs> a day alone as a kid, you know, <laughs> definitely makes sense why I'm like, I want to make a movie that's like an art house movie and it's like a version of my EP, but it's a movie, you know, it all kind of like correlates. Um, so yeah, I feel like those were like really like the times where music impacted me. And then of course, um, I got a disc man. And again, you know, being an only child and spending a lot of time alone, I would just honestly like, just go off into different worlds, honestly, in that zone. And it's just so funny now that it feels so funny to even say like disc man, because <laughs> it's like, what? it's just this woman to me, period. Like, you know, but um, yeah, also that, that weird little connection of just like having that escapism through this tool. And now it's like a, a nod to my career too, you know, so. Yeah, I think, you know, I had a lot of time alone as a kid and I think music was always my my thing, you know. Definitely. I think, um, was the box like, was it like the competitor to... Yeah, your, what was your, the MTV? And, and to MTV and the box, the, were they like the... Yeah, they were, um, and you'd, you'd jump back and forth from the two, you know. Yeah, the first few, mu the first few music channels on TV and was it the box you could text in? You could like... You could like, yeah. it was yeah. like, uh, almost like a jukebox yeah. style. All they yeah. had parts of that, didn't they? Yeah, and then sometimes, you know, in an hour they would play the same song like four times, but I love that, you know, I'd just be dancing in front of the TV and just having a great time by myself, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I was on the, on the same vibe. I was like, yeah, I was like, I felt like hook, line and sinker for all the uh, 90s, like marketing of America, like basketball. Oh. Yeah, yeah, MTV, hip hop. Those dating shows like, uh, what, like you know, the, there's one called Next with like the bus, and there was that big game show. Remember that big game show on MTV, and it was like dating, and um, uh, I can't remember. Like, that, that culture, I know exactly what you're saying. That had a big impression on me too, and that's why I was like, I want to live in America. I have to live in America, and like I have to, and now here I am. Fucking yeah, exactly. In you, hell. You know Living in hell. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. <laughs> I made it, babes. Like, yeah, look, look where I'm at now. Fuck you, Trump. Let's go. Oh. Uh, anyway. anyway, hell. Mate, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, it feels like it's a ticking time bomb at the minute, isn't it? Waiting for elections to roll around. And I guess it's even more different being there, you know? It's just insane. I mean, honestly... There's no politicians that I trust, period, right? And the whole system is, it, it, it's a thing, right? But I, just the fact that the president of the country that I live in is like making memes and jokes. No, and that's not even getting into like the actual real fucking fucked up shit that he's doing, you know? But the whole yeah. onion of it and the amount of layers and even the whole COVID thing, I just, it just is it's so absurd that I can't even articulate really how I feel about it because it's just so shocking to me. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just crazy, you know? And um, I remember someone made this comment to me when he first got in the office and they were like, you know, and I, and I hate to repeat this, but when you look at the history of this country, it's just like, you know, Trump is the president that America deserves and I don't want to say I agree with the word deserves but when you look at the history of this country and and everything and how it's gone down it it, it makes sense you know that there's this fucking insane psychopath running things you know yeah and there's a lot of people that seem to share his mentality or I don't know man it's and like in. that is why he got in you know I think people thought it was a joke didn't take it seriously but you know there's a lot of people that don't necessarily show their politics or where they lie but they're supporting it you know and I feel like that's just what happened with him and 
yeah, who knows what's going to happen. It's a scary time in America for so many reasons, but obviously that's like a big one, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, digging back into kind of like, I suppose, following on after those like early memories and, and kind of like, yeah, time with the box and, and <laughs> your, your very first disc woman. Um, <laughs> when did, like, how did you sort of, what came first, like producing or DJing or promoting? And like, what, what came what? first for me was uh, performance. Um, you know, I'd always been that kid. So from that, you know, watching the box and seeing dance and performance, you know, and, and my mother was a dancer too. And my, I mean, I didn't meet my dad till later on in life, but I always knew that he was a musician. And so it was just always a thing where I'd want to be in dance class and I'd want to do stuff like that. And then I ended up going to college and doing like an acting and drama and dance class. So that was always my, my zone and my place. Um, and then, you know, I was in college doing all this stuff and I needed a job, um, like a, a weekend job. And I'd always been interested in makeup too. Like it, it's another very insular thing as a child where, you know, being an only child, I would sit in front of the mirror and just like do my makeup and play with makeup as a kid, you know, and that was something, another like thing I would do. And um, makeup just felt really natural. And I'd always do my makeup like, yeah, well, now it probably wouldn't be considered nice, but back then it was nice. And I got into working at like l luxury makeup counter stores and stuff like that. And then eventually went to London College of Fashion where I did, uh, well, I ended up dropping out, but I started a course um, on image styling for performance, um, which was basically a lot of uh, prosthetics. You know, we would be given tasks, uh, we would, you know, our teacher would say okay there's a villain in a sci-fi movie and you have to create this character you know so I would be like creating all these demons angels monsters blah 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 blah. and around that time I met um uh, an artist and this was the days of myspace and so um I found this artist added her and then she added me back and I was like whoa and then you know those times I was like mainly presenting myself as um, a makeup artist because you know I just couldn't I mean I feel like music was always a goal but I just never imagined it happening for myself at that point you know it was just one of those things like oh they're celebrities or you know that's never going to be me um anyway and long story short this this artist uh contacted me and was like i'm really interested in you doing my makeup and long story short we met up we hung out and i brought one of my friends along <clears throat> and one of my, my my friend is the one who said you know that you know kerry sings right like she's a really good singer i mean i'm not saying i'm a good singer but he said that about me at the time and um then you know long story short i was invited into to join the band and then you know at the age of like from the age of like 19 to the to approaching 21 um i was just on a constant tour you know um in a black punk band like screaming and like rolling around on stage and also curating um makeup designs for the band and uh designing costumes and getting them made with my designer friends so you know and i i really had to escape my my home life so it was like it was like a perfect escape you know it really was like zero to a hundred it was like never actually thinking this could happen for me to then going and like performing at Glastonbury twice and then you know the next weekend I'm in Sweden and and then we're in New York doing um the Karen Paul Afropunk you know like seven years ago you know so I have uh always been like a performer you know I've always been a singer but then when I left the band um to kind of just move forward and just have a band out of thin air it just doesn't happen like that you know it doesn't happen like in the movies where it's like hey man hey yeah let's jam and then it's like a band you know it's like it's so much work and especially when it's your music and you're inviting people to play with you. It's not like, you know, I had, I have like very clear, solid ideas about sounds and things I want to execute. And so it really is like my band. And, you know, I was noticing that when I left the band I was in before, like after a month of not performing, 
I just felt a sadness within me. And I was like, this is, I feel fucking sad. What is going on? And I didn't realize how much performance was like a relief for me and also just such a healing space, you know? Um, so I was like, I need to, I need an outlet. You know, I, I really need an outlet immediately, like a quick one. And so I'd always wanted to DJ. Again, it was just one of those things that I just couldn't imagine for myself. You know, it's just one of those things where you see someone doing it and you're like, wow, okay, they're cool. You know, I never actually thought like, maybe I could do that. And so long story short, I just got this little program called Mix My Star and started like learning how to do mixes on the computer. And a friend of mine heard my mixes and he's a, a promoter in England, in London, and basically heard my mixes and was like, you have to come and play my party. And I was like, the problem is, is that I don't know how to use equipment. Um, but, you know, if you could let me into the club before opening, if you could give me like half an hour before the opening, I can like look at the CDJs and try and figure it out, you know? And so basically he was like, yep, yeah, sure, come through. I trust you. Like, I know you're not gonna let me down. Um, <clears throat> so I came with a friend who was a DJ and he kind of showed me, this is the cue, this is play, this is stop, um, you're gonna do this. And I was just like, well, okay. And then, you know, it was doors. And before I knew it, I was like DJing to, to a crowd. And it was honestly like, you know, and it's not like I hadn't been used to, to playing to big crowds, but this was my crowd, you know what I mean? These people, and I was in like a little, I'm always kind of put in like the third room or like the weird room, you know what I mean? And like, it was packed. It was absolutely packed. And like, it was, I just feel like moments like that, I don't even know what the fuck is going on. It's just happening, you know what I mean? And so, Still didn't have a clue what I was doing with CDJs, but it was working. And then my friend inv invited me back and was like, oh my God, we've never seen the room so busy and full like that. Um, would you like to come back and do a residency? And I think, um, you know, obviously I had no idea and no skill at that point, but I feel like this, the music that I was playing, um, which I started off playing, you know, 101 BPM Mumbaton, you know what I mean? Um, which is like, I feel like a dirty word now in the music uh, industry, because I just feel like, you know, it, Dave Nada pioneered, Dave Nada, yeah. Yeah, Dave Nada pioneered all of that, made it cool, made it sick. I'll never forget the first time I heard one of his songs. I just was fucking freaking out because that like deep, like low, like heavy, intense BPM. It just really resonates, resonated to me. I mean, clearly like I started fucking DJing off the base of just like, you know, and actually that's one thing I've, I've missed out. Like I wanted, I needed the outlet, but actually when I heard Mumbaton and Dave Nodder, the way he was flipping it, that really fueled a fire in me. I was like, oh my fucking God, this sounds fucking incredible. And you can't hear this anywhere in London. Like there was no one else playing it at the time and no one else wanted to, you know what I mean? But yeah. there were people that wanted to hear it, you know? Um, so I feel like it was my, my, my taste and my selection that I, had nothing to do with skill, obviously, because that was honestly like my first ever time really being on CDJs. Um, and then, yeah, before I knew it, I was there, like, I think it was every two weeks and I was just literally teaching myself on the job, which is just a, a theme in my life. Like, you know, I feel like there's never really chances for me to have access or like certain privilege to be able to learn, you know, it's like, I'm always just thrown in on the job, you know, um, which I think I appreciate at this point because it shaped me in a way that, <laughs> I love about myself and has given me qualities that I don't see in other people that I really admire about being able to just fucking figure it, you know, like, Not like straight, yeah, like be on it straight away. Yeah. A lot of people would kind of like drown in that situation. Right. Right. Exactly. And I, I also think that is also a result of certain traumas as well. Just, just really thinking on your feet and just doing that. But yeah, I wouldn't change any of it. Also, yeah, so basically I, you know, I really needed that outlet. That's the story of how I started DJing and, and that was it. I, st I had my little SoundCloud and then what happened? Then I traveled, then I, then I traveled to New York, did a few shows here and then in 2012, but then in 2013, I moved to Berlin 
And because I had come to New York for the three months that you're allowed, you know, when they... When the poorest like people a, are. Exactly. And obviously linking back to childhood, it was this thing. I was still like, I need to live in America. I'm obsessed with America. I have to be there. I'm going to take off when I get there, blah, 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 blah. So I saved up and came for the three months and um, did some shows and was a big part of an art space here called The Spectrum. Oh, uh, yeah. Which was very... Yeah. You know, but it's funny because... You know, Danny... Yes, 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 I know Danny. Um, but it's funny because, you know, the spectrum was was like happening before it got really popular. You know, we were in there doing like weird ass performance art pieces with like seven people in the space, you know, and then it became, and then we were doing parties too. And then after a couple of years, it got crazy, you know. So I was, I came to New York and, and that's really the place where people recognize me as a DJ, you know. And then I had to leave America. I wasn't allowed to stay here. I got back to London and I was like, I cannot be here either. My body was just rejecting it. And honestly, within like two days, I was on a bus. <laughs> Cause I also had, I was broke. I had no money, you know, but I knew that I couldn't stay in, um, in London. And I think I had about like 500 pounds that I turned into euros and I just packed two suitcases and got on a bus from um, London to Berlin. And I got to Berlin, obviously all, every, all my plan, my apartment fell through, everything was hell murderous. But luckily for me, there's a very special artist called Mama. Do you know Mama from Batty Bass? Mm. Do you know Batty Bass with Hannah Holland? Yeah, I, I think I met her. Like She's like the main vocalist from that crew. Yeah, I know if I saw her, I think. Yeah, so it was a thing where I told her I was coming anyway, and she was like, yeah, we'll hang out. And then I got there and I was like, oh, babe, I'm actually here, but I'm really in this fucking terrible situation. And she just cradled me and took me in. And then that night I met one of my best friends, uh, Hollywood, who's also just took me under their wing and was like, you know, the next day took me out to print CVs and was showing me like, you can work here and you don't have to speak German. And, you know, and then I was just working in like a, an English pub in Berlin, you know, <laughs> uh, while, while also trying to get gigs. And it was good. You know, when I was in Berlin, I ended up playing at um, uh, Panorama, Berghain Panorama. You know, I just did weird things like that. But ultimately, I was still... Do, I was still in the BPM range of like 110 to like 120 in Berlin. You know what I'm saying? That's like <laughs> definitely not the vibe. But again, oh, usually, yeah. because, I, because I was the only person really playing that style of music, I would get booked. You know what I mean? But it, it just, and, and so I feel like, yeah, I've even though I really started as a performer, I really came up as a DJ, you know, playing in, Berlin, London, New York, you know. And so then I lived in Berlin for a really long time and was long distance with my ex-partner. And then, you know, gay marriage was announced and my ex was like, do you want to get married? So, you know, and I was like, yeah, I wanted to get married and live with you. And so then I came to um, America and how the whole disc woman alignment happened is, is another whole story because in Berlin, um, my roommate, wanted to rent out her room and so I was like I'll help you rent the room out and the person that came in the room is best friends with Emma Umfang from oh. uh Disc Woman so you know when when I met Jen their name is and they moved into the apartment and I said oh I'm a DJ and she was like oh my best friend's a DJ too like you have to you have to like get to know each other and so we met over we met very briefly like in when I was in Berlin and Emma was obviously in America and we said hi or you're a DJ too cute hi blah 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 but it wasn't until I moved to America um and Emma knew that I moved to America and this woman I think had just formulated like around that time because I'm really the first like person really that's been there the longest from the beginning mm -hmm. um i know volvox was one of those people too in the very very beginning um and so yeah i was there and it's funny because i moved to uh new york with my leg in a cast no way 
that's a whole nother yeah I went through a crazy year where I moved to New York with my leg in a cast because in Berlin I just got out of bed the wrong way one day and my ankle just snapped underneath me yeah, yeah so it broke clean but then the healing was pretty clean because it just like glued back however yeah I came <laughs> I can't yeah and that's another thing why my my partner at the time was like you know, I was like in Berlin in a cast kind of like, you know, I'm kind of estranged from my family and it, they were just like, what the fuck? You need to just come here now so I can look <laughs> after you. So, um, yeah, but, you know, I came and healed and then literally like a year after that, um, I was like, I want to start bike riding because I've gained a bunch of weight from like recovering and not moving and, you know, long story short, I had a big, big, huge bike accident where a car hit my bike at full speed. And uh, if if it had been like a second sooner, uh, I feel like I, it w- like they would have hit me. I'm really lucky that the car hit my bike because it was oh, at full speed. But the impact still flew me in the air and flipped me to the ground, um, which then I had like a several slip discs from. And it was just like another year of recovery you know and then (laughs) the cherry on top you know they say it comes in freeze so you know again another year of physical therapy another year of treatment another year of you know coming back into an able body and uh, I booked a makeup gig with Gypsy Sport Mm -hmm. because I came to America and I was still doing makeup because even though it's like a challenging creative field I just couldn't imagine myself ever like working in an office or doing showing up to the same place every day. It's just is not for me, you know? So kind of really brazen of me <laughs> to come from nothing with no support to be like, I'm doing these two creative things and that's it. You know what I mean? <laughs> not to say like I hadn't had jobs or been scamming in between then, but you know, I was definitely hell bent on creating a creative career for myself you know um so you know had the broken ankle recovered got hit by the car recovered and then and it's all kind of like a year to the day it's really fucking freaky but then I was invited to work on a shoot and after the shoot it went so well and everyone was like Kerry you know let's go out and celebrate you you have been hiding and healing and fucked up for two years like let's go out and enjoy you and I was like yeah you know (laughs) and we fucking went out and I bumped into someone who I fucking hate and my ankle twisted and fractured. Ah, no way. Yes. And I, uh, two surgeries later and um, a nine inch metal rod and plates and screws in my ankle later. Uh, yeah, like I'm now back into an able body, you know? So it's, it's you know, this also, this, this time and also going through it, this was all happening while I was dealing with immigration stuff as well. So, and oh. also you know, being, not being in an able body and not being from this country, you know, not really having anything outside of art in terms of like qualifications, you know, survival again was just like crazy, you know? And so it really took away from my creativity, you know? And I feel like, yeah, definitely. I don't want to say like, I feel like I lost years of my life, but I definitely lost years of my creative career you know and a lot of things just had to be held back because I couldn't do it I physically couldn't do it you know so um and I don't you know I'm very careful about how I speak about this because you know ableism is a real thing and and you know for me I've come back into an able body but all those things that happened to me it's it's like you know there's a I was in a wheelchair you know for kind of like those three years basically or on crutches um so yeah it's something that I do want to talk about it about more but I just and and obviously I can share my own experience but on a broader sense you know ableism like should be discussed I mean even you know just and it shouldn't be just because I had that personal experience you know now I think like this you know um so for instance when I'm I I throw I have my party here which is called seltzer which is you know uh an underground kind of rave situation even though since we started it now we have a a really amazing residency at a a fucking amazing club in um 
called Nowadays in Brooklyn. But, you know, long story short, even with things like that, you know, it's accessibility is, is really important, you know, and I think everyone needs to think about that more. You know, there were times where I would just have to like literally get on my knees sometimes and like crawl upstairs and do crazy things. And there were some times where I was having to say yes to gigs because I needed the money, you know what I mean? So I was showing up to fucking gigs on crutches, you know? And that's not because, you know, I mean, yeah, it's because I was probably an idiot, but really it's because I needed the fucking money, you know? Um, so yeah so you know and it's honestly been like it's really been the last three years of me being in an able body where I've been given the chance to really just drive through and do what I need to do you know yeah and then COVID happened so like I just oh, I hate it here I really fucking hate it here but yeah, yeah. it's kind of like that sort of yeah, like forced, I don't know, yeah, it's just something that's kind of like, yeah, it just seems like it's in the way, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I just feel like I've been robbed, you know, like I just feel really robbed, you know, yeah. and I feel like the uncertainty is the thing that bothers me the most, you know, just like having no idea when this is going to end or when it's going to be safe, you know, it this is really fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I think... I was chatting to someone yesterday and I was just saying that, yeah, I think especially like now, now the weather's changed in the UK, I think the sort of reality, the reality of what the winter is going to be looking like if we've got these like, you know, circuit breaker lockdowns or... Yeah, know. but the thing that's going on here is like, you know, and I know that in, in England now it's like if there's a group of six or more or something, there's just like jail or some shit which is it's which is terrible to me which i feel like is going to create a lot of terrible situations but what people are doing here is they're just having parties at home you know because that's what i thought i was like well at least it's gonna get cold soon and you know they can't be outside and uh, and it's like no girl like people are actually just gonna bring this shit into their house where there's no open air and it's gonna get worse <laughs> you know what i mean it's going to get worse so you know yeah, it's um, it's definitely yeah. The un the uncertainty is the is the is the thing, isn't it? It's um, and the, the thing that they seem to want to just put all like restrictions on is any form of socialising. You mm -hmm. know, it's like okay, well the economy's back open, but like yeah, you guys can just fucking knock yourselves away. I keep seeing on Twitter that <laughs> I, British Twitter keeps being like. Why is this surrounded by the pub? Like, why does the news keep talking about the pub? Like, and everything about COVID is revolving around the pub. <laughs> just like, I had to laugh. Yeah. Like, that makes a lot of sense for my country, you know? Yeah, and especially, like, the thing with, like, the, the lack of sort of financial support, I suppose, for the arts as well, which, again, I think is another, like, sort of reality check in terms of where we are now and, you know, funding sort of drying up and then the funding list came out last week and then there's been loads of shit about that and like where funds have gone and yeah I don't know it's kind of um I, I hope that people start paying for more live streams that's what I hope of DJ yeah I, yeah I was thinking the other day I was like you know honestly but I mean, I love partying at home. I think it's, it's great. I can do what I want. There's no fucking security guard telling me, oh, don't do that. You know what I mean? It's just like, I love going crazy at home. <laughs> <laughs> I love going crazy at home. But, you know, I had to just stop myself because what I just said, you know, it's like, I love going crazy at home. And, you know, I could maybe have three people in my apartment max if 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 anything like that I needed to do anything like that but people are just gonna have big groups of people in their house you know but I do think there needs to be a, a system for paying for live streams just moving forward you know and I definitely have done some little things like you know there's been some live streams well one that was like you know that was paying me anywhere close to my rate you know but more time it's just it's not it's not a waste of my it's, it's not worth my energy to do that you know what I mean and I just feel like playing a set in a room by myself is just so many so many planets away from playing to an audience you know that I'm not quick to just be like yeah 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 I'll do it because it's just like 
I also don't need to, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't need to do that. Um, but if there's an opportunity that's presented that can pay me, then fuck yeah, because, you know, I miss making money, god damn it. Yeah, I know. It's, um, yeah, I think, like, well, I think I think certain platforms have been testing it out, and I think, um, I think Mixcloud is starting some, like, paid streaming thing. Um, LOL Mixcloud, oh, my God, I was... <laughs> tweeted about them the other day i was like hang it up i was like <laughs> <laughs> you're done maybe, maybe I don't give a fuck about mixed cloud but maybe they're being smart now. maybe maybe because i tweeted that they're like you know what like, we'll put together and yeah. figure this out um, but that's cool i hope someone figures out something because it's crazy so what how about you how have you been looking in covid time um well kind of day job like actually didn't really kind of slow down at all for me um so i kind of like managed like e-com and socials and stuff like that and i like you're good you're good did yeah like online web stores were just like kind of thriving i guess which kind of was yeah kind of felt really weird because it was like well hang on, like, I know loads of people are struggling for cash, yeah, like, some companies are still raking it in, plus also some people have got additional or the same amount of money or more money, disposable money to spend because right. they're not spending it on travel to work or, I don't know. Right. Okay. But, um, but no, like, my wife, she's a hairstylist. She couldn't work for, like, three months. Um, she, she in a salon? She like Well, she, she does, like, half salon and then half, like, mobile so Real stuff? Okay. yeah so um so so like yeah the salon was completely closed and then she started back like maybe a week before doing mobile before she went back into the salon which was until july mm -hmm. um but like we got a one and a half year old daughter <laughs> yeah <Congratulations>. and, <laughs> thank you yeah and literally like before mm. literally the, like we all had a family event the weekend before lockdown and like she couldn't walk and the the whole three months, the whole 12 weeks, by the end, she was like walking around, drawing on the walls. <laughs> oh, you know what though? I think there's, I think, you know, it's really beautiful that you got to have that time with your daughter, you know, like I feel like had it been regular time, you would have missed out on probably all of those, so many of those little moments and, you know, even though this is such a fucking horrendous, horrific, horrible time and rest in peace to anyone who has passed from COVID. I know that I have friends who have lost parents and loved ones and yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. And that's also why, you know, these illegal parties that are going on, it's just like, you know, I'm just like, if, if, if you can't see how a deadly global pandemic you know, if you can't see how our, if, if a pandemic is not making us see how our actions affect each other, then there is no fucking hope, you know? And for me, it becomes particularly frustrating because I pride my community. You know, my community is, um, you know, queer, you know? And I just expect a certain level from people that want to call themselves queer, you know? Um, and it's just like, you know, these parties that are happening, you've got DJs DJing without a mask even, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it's, kind of, it's very interesting to see, not the us and them, because I don't want to make it about that. And I'm honestly at the point where I just don't care anymore. Like, I feel like I was like Rona police in the beginning being like, oh, this is, a, and it's just like, you know, it's going to happen either way. And I'm just at the point where I don't care about it on that level, but I do care about it spreading. And, you know, it's just like, I feel like a lot of baby DJs and, you know, people that want to be, you know, a DJ yeah. are using this as an opportunity to, you know, take up that space. And also as well, it's just crazy because, you know, I know these gigs are not paying any money. I mean, you might be lucky to get $50, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just like, that doesn't even make sense in terms of like your health insurance and risking your life. Do you know what I'm saying? Because if you got Corona from being in that place, 
the $50 that they're paying you is not going to help you when you need medicine and you need help. You know what I'm saying? And that's when people start GoFundMe's, you know what I mean? And it's just like, I just feel like, and, I, and, I mean, and it's very personal for me too, because I live alone. I mean, I have my two, my two children, my two cats, right? But it's the three of us, you know, I'm not interacting with humans every day. You know, the, that environment, the club, the CDJs, you know, it, 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 it's a career for me because it's such a relief for me. It's like, I'm, it's therapy for me, you know? And I feel like it's an exchange with the audience. And again, you know, it's like what I was saying before when I left the band and I didn't have that outlet, I got really sad, you know? And it's, it's the same thing. I feel sad not having that outlet. It's so personal to me. And I'm someone I live alone. There's nothing more I want than to be with everyone fucking drinking and dancing and listening to fucking, you know, my music even. You know, I haven't even heard my, I've released music this year and I have not heard it on a big sound system. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like it's not more than anything to, to fill my community and be around people, but my, my needs can, can wait while there's people dying, you know? And that's the thing, like people, it's not like people are just sick. People are really dying, you know? And people's moral compasses is not, is not where it should be, you know? People are more concerned about their DJ dreams coming true for no money. <laughs> it's just like, you know, and I get, you know, I'm 33 as well, so, and I've been doing this since I was a teenager, you know? And I feel like a lot of the, the baby DJs are just learning their lessons. You know, that's all I can put it down to. I, I don't have any resentment towards them. I understand, you know, everyone is going through their own fucking thing and making their own decisions, but I don't like it. And I, but I do appreciate that, you know, they'll probably look back and be like, I hope they'll look back and be like, that wasn't the best idea. Because I had to ask myself, I was like, you know what, if I was 21, would I be going to these parties? And I would like to give myself some credit, but honestly, I can't really answer that like straight up. I feel like I might have folded, you know, and might have just not been, you know, my brain not developed enough to figure out how fucking wrong that is, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, is that happening in London too? Are you noticing that too? Um, I've seen a couple of like videos and stuff of like a few parties, but like, nothing that was like really regular but yeah even still i think like yeah i kind of like sort of side with you in the opinion that like you know i think it's yeah like you said the your own dreams and kind of like your own needs can kind of wait for a minute even though it's like you know frustrating and you know it can hurt financially and all sorts of other ways you know it's like yeah we just have to kind of like sort of try and enjoy being able to take stock of kind of what's going on, you know? Right. And I'm, I just want to ask these people, like, was it worth it? Was it worth it? You know, and I just also hate this whole thing of like social distancing and mask required on the flyer. It's like, you know what? You can just say that to make yourself feel better, to kind of pacify whatever guilt you're feeling. But the truth of the matter is none of that's going to happen, especially in an environment where people are drinking alcohol. You know, and it really pisses me off when people want to compare these two things to like protesting and raving and be like, well, people are protesting. Yeah, because that's like, you know, extremely necessary. That is essential work. You know what I mean? And people are not drinking and sniffing and doing what I mean they might be some of them might be you know <laughs> at the protest but that's not what it's aimed towards you know what I'm saying and so I just think it's really fucking rude to to compare the two even though I think protesting who wanted to do that of course that's gonna you know I, I totally totally acknowledge that that too is a spreader and fucking something that is like awful but protesting and raving I don't know I don't know. I just feel like the revolution is not at the CDJs right now. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely not at the CDJs, like, that you can celebrate on the CDJs after. Exactly. Oh, my God. Listen, listen. My first gig, my first real gig, mm. is when this is over, it's just, it literally has to, look, like, it's going to last three days, I feel like. It's going to be... <laughs> 72-hour set. 
literally, I'm like, give it to me. I'm just like, give me 48 hours. I'll do it, you know. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take the neural link. The CDJ will be plugged in. Exactly. <laughs> give me a porter potty. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> When do you when do you reckon the next parties are going to be? When do you think it's going to be going to be safe? You know, I'm a person. I really like to <clears throat> be really fucking realistic, so I'm not setting myself up. Honestly, I just feel like 2022 because uh, I feel like I feel like there's going to be a vaccine before that. But is everyone going to take the vaccine immediately? Does I, I personally don't want to be one of the I'm not an anti-vaxxer, let me just put that out there, but I'm not I'm not willing to be one of the first people to take the first vaccine, especially with this fucking president. You know what I mean? Right. Um so I think it's gonna be a process, and even with there being a vaccine, I don't know if everyone is gonna take it or even have access or even be afford to be able to take it. So, um, <clears throat> honestly, I'm just giving myself the reality of like 2022 and being hopeful because I still feel like, you know, that that may not even happen. And that still might be like really hopeful thinking, you know? Yeah, I I was chatting about it the other day and I think I, I said the like summer next year, I think. But mm -hmm. again, like, I don't know if that's me being too optimistic. <laughs> I, and that's what it's I mean. It's like it's just opinion. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a matter of opinion. None of us really know. We can just be hopeful. You know what I mean? And like, but even then, I'm just like, I feel like it's going to be a whole new world. You know? And I feel like a lot. Sometimes more time, our fee is dependent on capacity. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, you have your set fee, but you know, you can make more or less depending on the capacity situation and. It's just going to fuck us up. It's just really annoying. And I just, again, just feel so robbed because I really worked so hard and, like, reached a point in my career where I was, like, comfortable, you know, and, like, living off that, which to me is something I never, ever imagined for myself, especially me, just because I don't have any, you know, I survived my childhood, basically, you know, I don't have any, you know, I just did it all my fucking self, in an art world with no help and I've just been robbed. You know what I mean? That's how I feel, you know? So it sucks, but I feel like, you know, I'm trying to be positive and trying to create new things, which is also really hard to do in this space. You know, it's really hard to just, my inspiration comes from being out in the world and, you know, and like Absorb. a lot of my music absorbing things and you know a lot of my music is processing trauma and so to kind of create such a heavy project without my outlets or any relief it's very fucking heavy but I just trust the process and you know <laughs> trust the process but that's exactly what I'm doing you know and trying to just make the best work of my life and really trying to just like get the visuals done and just just really show the world what I'm about because I really don't think I haven't done that yet even though I know like I have really what I want to do. I haven't even given it yet. So I have that to focus on, you know? Yeah, I feel like the, I don't know, like you said, all the elements that kind of sort of stem back from childhood are all come back into the, the kind of the one project now. Yeah, and whether yeah, that, yeah. You know what I mean? Like the, the live performance, the watching the box. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, there's that thing of like, oh, you're old because you're like in your thirties now. It's like those those stupid things that your brain tells yourself and society tells you. And it's like, no, actually, this is this is the time. It all makes sense. I've had all this experience. I've done all of this, and it's time to now put it together. And, and honestly, I'm so happy I haven't peaked yet. You know what I mean? I just feel like I'm really glad I didn't peak, and that didn't happen for me yet. So. So I think, you know, just everything happens when it's supposed to, even though it can be annoying. <laughs> Definitely. Have you, uh, are you working on anything at the minute or have you got any plans for releases that are coming up in the next few months or what's yeah, on the horizon I, for you? The horizon. So I had, uh, I self-released two EPs um, this year. Uh, <laughs> the first one I did, uh, the first EP is called Demoed and basically you know, I saw this whole Bandcamp day rush was going on and I was like, 
you know, I had songs on Bandcamp. Honestly, I was really fucking slow and playing down Bandcamp and it was just really silly of me because I was honestly giving music away for free before Bandcamp day. And um, <clears throat> I was like, oh, well, I want to be part of this. So I just, you know, literally just put out a bunch of demos and I have done so many shoots and so many things like that. that I do have images just to, you know, make it happen. I was like, all right, let's see if I can get some money, you know? And I did so well. It, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, for so many years, I've held off really, like, really putting music out there or, you know, putting a package and saying, here. And I woke up one morning at six in the morning. I was like, I want to fucking do that. And so I just literally slashed some demos together, you know, got my picture for it. And I couldn't believe the response that I got. You know, it was it was very affirming. Like, I made a really good amount in one day. And I was like, well, this is amazing. This makes me want to do more. You know what I mean? And this is great because this is... I just, again, it's like I have a lot of um, imposter syndrome, you know, it's this kind of thing where it's like, oh, can I do that? I don't know, you know, and it's like people, I know it's like, there's people like with no talent that have no imposter syndrome that like have all the confidence, you know, and it's just like, it's, and then, you know, I know it's like people that have imposter syndrome have so much to like give to the world and are not giving it, you know, because of all the fucking mental illness. <laughs> you know yeah, like talking yourself out of it like yeah right and it's just like and I think for me specifically I spent so long so many years just figuring shit out waiting to this bone is fixed you know oh I can't do this job because I don't have my green card yet and la di da di da di da di da that it just was that that day and that moment <laughs> you know and it's like years of thinking how am I going to release it and I woke up one morning and just put it together in like an hour I did it got a really good response um and then I put out another EP uh spell again which got really really good um feedback but you know it's just me doing it myself it, it wasn't really that serious to me you know what I mean like it's not like I had, like, a, I've organised a, you know, I, I guess I am somewhat a record label because I did self-release and I would love to really develop it and have other artists. But I I also decided that I want a little bit more experience and I also want to just, like, give birth to my huge project. And then I feel like I can really focus on other people. I don't want to like bring people in and be like, yeah, it's a late. And, and then actually just not be able to uh, nurture talent in the way that it deserves, you know? So <clears throat> I, I do have a record label, I guess. <laughs> and um, it's called Black Power Records. And um, yeah, I guess I did a bunch of self-release. And then now I'm working with Umfang who has a label called Thanks. And we're going to do a little release, you know, just so I can, well, I love Emma and I, I want to release with her, but I also want, you know, just that experience I was talking about, you know, and have her lead me, you know, and, and show me like how she's been doing it and stuff like that. And I just love Emma so much. Like Emma is, you know, so many, like a connecting dot for me, you know, in so many ways. Um, very, very special woman, you know, and, don't really, white women really stress me out most of the time, you know, she's, uh, she gets it, you know, she's done the work and she's unlearned a lot of stuff and <clears throat> she's open to dialogue, you know, yeah. and um, I'm not in the business of like praising white people for doing what they need to do, but and I'm very selective about like what white people I'm interacting with and, and working with, um, but I, I can definitely vouch for, for Emma, for sure. So I'm excited to release with her. And we're, you know, now when I get off this call with you, I'm putting mood boards together and really trying to execute the, you know, because being a makeup artist, working on shoots, it's all there. It's all there. I bet. I've, just, I've just never really got the chance to really compartmentalise it because that was the thing as well. You know, when I was doing shows, it was like, Friday well the Thursday would take up my day organizing the songs I'd be gone Friday maybe Saturday Sunday Monday is recovering then Tuesday Wednesday I just found like it a little bit too overwhelming to really get into the zone of creating and that's my own kind of like sensitivity I need to just get over that in my head but I'd get into a zone and then it'd be time to go again you know and so in a way I kind of appreciate just having 
this time to really lay it all out, you know, and be able to execute it, you know. So yeah, by the end of the year, trying to get that together. Amazing. Yeah, I think I'm excited to see what comes. I feel like there's like, yeah, I feel like you've got already got your yeah, your elements visualized that you just need to uh, create create the masterpiece. Exactly. It's basically a horror movie, you know. My you know I'm spooky, so <laughs> yeah, <it's> spooky. <laughs> Sick. Horror horror movie coming in December then, yeah? Yeah, literally. <laughs> I'm trying to make it happen, seriously. <laughs> Obviously, I, I make a joke. I'm like, I am living an American horror story, like being out here right now with this president and stuff. So, but yeah, trying to get all that done before the year is out. Cool. It sounds like there's, um, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, despite the challenges, there's been a lot of creative projects that have come out already and a lot on the horizon as well. So super hyped to to hear the the the... The process is still thriving and you're trusting in it. Oh God, I know. I don't know how. I'm still going, but it's going, you know, and we'll see. We'll see yeah, what happens. Definitely. Before we uh before we sign off, are there any uh special shout outs you want to give or kind of uh any yeah. last parting words? You know, um forever shout out to Disc Woman, shout out to Pre Columbian Chaska, my uh one of my best friends and you know my partner in crime that we throw salsa together. Uh Pre Columbia is an incredible DJ producer, get into her. Um but I just think lastly, you know, this is a really, really tough year in so many ways for so many people. And I just think we need to really just be kind with each with, with, with each other, you know, and just take time, don't make any assumptions about people or what's going on, you know. Um, be clear in communication. You know, Mars is in Mercury and Mars right now are like fighting, you know, and not oh, to get all like not to get all like that, but <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it must, they must, uh, yeah, it must have some effect. Absolutely. And it's just like, um, yeah, we just have to wash our hands, be safe, be nice to each other. And I, you know, I think that lays the premise of some kind of safety and, you know, how we're going to get through the end. Of, well, I want to keep saying the end of this year, like COVID is just going to end on January 1st. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just like this, you know, Brexit. <laughs> right, and also as well, I just, you know, it's really important I say that about how we're treating each other because, yeah, we spoke about how the winter is going to affect the parties and people are just going to have them in their house, whatever, but people won't be able to just do those things of like, let's just go for a walk, let's have a picnic, da da da. So I feel like, you know, depression is, depression is already, and suicide this year is like super ripe, you know? Um, People have lost everything, you know, and a lot of people are fighting silent battle, battles you have no idea about, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I just want to leave on a note where I just want to encourage everyone to just take time with each other, you know, think about your friends, think about your community, reach out to people, you know, if you're a white person, put your money where your mouth is you know what I mean put your hands in your pockets do do something for free for a black person you know what I mean I just need people to be super mindful you know because I'm not seeing a lot of that right now in people which I also understand because you know people act out in different ways and some people need more help and care than others but yeah just wash your hands and be nice to each other is my final thought excellent couldn't have said it any better at all myself um yeah, yeah. I, think, I think i think yeah i think being mindful and yeah like just having compassion for anyone right now like regardless of your own situation or anyone else's you know i think um yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of hatred being spread out there and you know it's it's kind of like you need to uh you know accept it and kind of like deflect that you know it's not um it's not the one um so yeah definitely it's been an absolute pleasure 
thanks for having me. This has been great. And yeah, like, yeah, thank you. Yeah, specifically, thanks for having me because I want to do more talking stuff. You know, you saw my tweet, like I'm thinking about doing my own little podcast. There's that meme and it's like, I'm at the, or something, it's like I'm at the stage of quarantine of doing a podcast. <laughs> it's like... you, should, you should do it. You should do it. If you feel like you should, you need to do it, then just do it. Like, yeah. So, um... I think do it i'll invite you on my show and then i'll, I'll ask you some questions <laughs> <laughs> deal deal cool all right well look i'll leave you to it have an excellent okay. weekend and uh, okay. yeah let's take it baby and everyone be safe and thanks for having me <laughs> thanks for your time see you later